For me, it all started in 1982 when I purchased the information package from Benson Aircraft Corporation. Um, a lot has happened since that time, and my dream to own and fly a gyrocopter, a gyroplane, uh, part of that was I met a gentleman by the name of Bob Vermeulen, and we'd had several conversations about starting an aircraft company that would produce parts for uh, both experimental and ultralight aircraft. Well, while we were having those discussions, I was out surfing the internet and went to the popular rotorcraft site and happened to see on their homepage a little animated icon that said new, and it talked about uh, ultralight part 103 gyrocopter, gyroplane. So I went to that site and downloaded the plans and started email back and forth between myself and Ralph Taggart. A uh, little time after that, I went over to Mason, Michigan and they had conversations with Ralph Taggart. And we're sitting there with plenty of hot coffee and donuts and talking about uh, ultralights in general, gyroplanes in particular. And it suddenly occurred to me that uh, this would be more of an opportunity than just getting the, uh, the gyro in kit form. And so I posed a question to him that I don't think he expected. Uh, I said, why do you want to kit the gyro when you can kit the next one? And he sort of gave me a puzzled look and he said, well, what next one? And I said, well, I've got a lot of stuff sitting in the computer that's been sitting there for a, a couple of years now that if I were to build a new ultralight, it would incorporate a whole bunch of ideas that we'd gathered in the time, oh, since 1990 that we've been flying the gyro bee. And why don't we do the next generation ultralight gyroplane? Well, he was enthusiastic about that, and uh, one thing led to another, and uh, pretty soon uh, he starts working on his CAD system, and I'm starting to get copies of drawings, and we're talking back and forth on the telephone, and uh, it was a long haul. It didn't. It didn't take a lot of time to put the design ideas together. Uh, it's easy to build a gyroplane on paper. Uh, the really difficult point is when you start to go from paper and you're beginning to cut metal, do all the nasty engineering that's involved to take an airplane of any sort, an aircraft from a paper concept to something that will really fly. And that just seemed to take forever. It didn't really, if you look at uh, less than a year's development time, from the time we sat at this kitchen table uh, munching on donuts and talking about concepts to the point where it was actually flying. Bob and I built the prototype. That meant that we started working some very long hours if, and that was necessary because we wanted to make the Popular Rotocraft Association show in Mentone of that year. Um, that meant that the the finish of the aircraft as well as the design was sort of an ongoing process as we were getting ready to start the ground hopping and the ground testing. We were looking at a really a brand new airframe, a brand new engine at that time with a Kawasaki uh, 440 fan cooled and we had Rotorhawk blades and there were just a lot of things that had to come together uh, in order to make this a success before the, the Mentone convention. I also want to give Jim and, and Bob Vermeulen lots and lots of credit because it's one thing to take an idea. I can sit here and sketch out on a napkin and say, well, here's how you do a, a gear leg out of fiberglass. But it's another thing to know exactly what fittings you're going to use, how those are going to be machined, how you're going to set it up for the CNC drilling. Uh, we talked about the possibility of a trike type of, of nose wheel steering. Uh, but talk is cheap. Uh, actually coming up with, with the hardware, I think one of the most challenging aspects about gyroplanes, and it's subtle, you don't notice it, is nose wheel steering. Uh, the, uh, the honeybee turns out to have magnificent nose wheel steering capability, and uh, that's almost entirely due to the effort that uh, Jim and Bob put into it. So it was, it was really a collaborative effort. It was a fun time in terms of development. Uh, Don Chubb and I got to see it for the first time in real life when they brought it out to the field, oh, about Mentone time last year. One of the most exciting days of my flying career to see uh, the honeybee, and it, it was almost a duplicate of our gyro bee. And first thing I wanted to do was sit in it. It didn't have any blades on it. I just wanted to sit in it. It was just exciting. And within a few days, we uh, had it on the taxiway. Uh, uh, doing uh, taxiing with it and, and kind of do a test pilot analysis of it. 
the aircraft would crow hop, but it simply wouldn't fly out of ground effect. Um, I began to wonder whether I was getting a little gun shy flying somebody else's brand new prototype gyro that they just poured most of a year into. and. Maybe I was being a little bit too conservative, so I said to Don, I said, Don, well, why don't you run it up and down a couple times? And that was uh, a point when it was uh, still equipped with the uh, Kawasaki that they were trying to develop. And that was both exciting and frustrating. Uh, we got through the initial phases of the ground hopping and the ground testing, and uh, we were very happy with the airframe, and the, the ground testing and the ground hopping gave us a little bit more insight as to what we really needed to do as our next step. Uh, within a few days, uh, uh, Mentone, uh, the convention, uh, was was on, and Jim and Bob had taken the honeybee to Mentone, and actually we had the honeybee and the gyro bee in the same display, and people were very interested, uh, and that was gratifying. After all the bother of, of, of Mentone and the excitement of exhibiting the aircraft down at Mentone on the static display, uh, the guys buckled down and uh, put the Rotax on it, uh, worked with Powerfin to develop an optimum prop, and uh, Jim was going to bring it up uh, on a Saturday afternoon uh, so that we could do the first test flying on the new engine. But then he, uh, he cheated. Uh, he was out there at Lowell taxiing on a, a, probably on a Friday. And that son of a gun, rather than giving us the chance to fly it the first time, he went ahead and flew it the first time. But I think that uh, gives you some sort of a feeling for the stability and ease of handling of the aircraft. Because although Jim has had some basic ultralight gyroplane instruction, it was just a few hours. He's an experienced fixed wing ultralight flyer. But he was able to take that aircraft up, and within days, he was flying in 20 and 25 mile an hour winds. And I think that's probably the best, uh, the best guide that I can give you to the overall stability of the aircraft. Just a little over a week from Solo, uh, he went along with me on a, on a 27 mile jaunt cross country to Fowlerville, which is probably one of the neatest days I've ever had in ultralight flying, because in all those years, Don and I were sharing one aircraft. Um, if, if Don had been there that day, one of us would have flown it over and the other would have flown it back. Never had the opportunity to do a flight like that and be able to look out to one side and there's another gyroplane. You know, that, was, uh, that was really neat. And to have it be not just any gyroplane, but uh, the honeybee that we've been working so hard on was really exciting. The honeybee really is an evolution. Uh, because of the time constraints, we couldn't continue developing the Kawasaki engine package and that's why the prototype is currently flying with a Rotex 447 and, and flying very well. Um, the prototype that that we have spent all the time flying and ground testing and hopping and improving is much different than the prototype uh, ended up being. The actual production version is very different. Cosmetically still looks the same but overall performance and handling is much different. Jim and I are pretty much uh, average run-of-the-mill guys. Uh, Jim is involved in sales. Uh, I have a video production company. We both work hard. We're willing to do whatever it takes to make things happen. Uh, we're both married. We have lovely wives. Uh, we have uh, each have a son and a daughter. Jim's got a dog. I've got two cats. So we're pretty average. And uh, like everybody else, we don't make an unusual amount of money. Both of us uh, do have one thing, though. We are a bit of entrepreneurs, and we uh, like doing something for ourselves. The other thing is, is we're both willing to work as hard as we have to work, do whatever we have to do to make something happen. And uh, that was very important with starting up Gyrotech. Our goal, really, for Gyrotech from the very beginning has been uh, to provide a high quality, innovative, uh, safe, uh, and affordable flying machine uh, to other people just like ourselves. There's so many people that want to be able to fly and they just can't afford it. And that's the situation Jim and I have been in. And uh, so that was our goal when we started Gyrotech. 
was to take people that want to be able to fly and give them a machine that they can afford. This is the Honeybee Gyro. It is the prototype. It is based on the world standard of Dr. Ralph Taggart's Internet Gyro Bee. There are a number of features that it has that are different than the Gyro Bee, but the basic standard Gyro Bee airframe and seat arrangement are all basic Gyro Bee. If you look at the three major components of the airframe, you have the mast, you have the keel, and in the back that holds the tail, you have the tail boom. If you were to look at the internet download from Dr. Taggart's Gyro B, you would find that the dimensions on those are, are exactly the same with a couple cosmetic differences. Those differences are, if you notice in the front, there is an angle on the front portion of the tail boom. And then in the back portion of the keel behind the cluster plates, you do have the little 45 degree angle. Now based on that standard, we'll go around the airframe and tell you what some of the differences are. If you notice right up front, uh, one of the immediate differences cosmetically is the, is the nose gear. It is very similar to a trike type of a nose gear, and yet there are some differences to the gyro bee. If you notice that the rudder pedals have an active cable actuation, in other words, we're going to use the top of the pedal to pull the rudder control horn without the crossover that uh, was originally on the gyro bee. Now, in addition to that, we've also gone to some direct rods and links to the nose gear. In doing that, it gives one a very good feel of the craft while it's on the ground, and at the same time, gives you some play 
as you begin to correct for uh, both P factor as well as airspeed while you're on the runway. And it gives you a very good feel of the uh, aircraft. Now a couple other differences that we'll talk about, uh, you're, you're looking at the throttle quadrant, it's mounted comfortably on the seat, it allows you to fly the craft with your hand rested comfortably off to your left side. Uh, the control stick is also conveniently located so that when you're in level flight, it literally rests off from your right thigh. Very comfortable flying. Another feature about the airframe, again, which is the Gyro B standard, which we maintained, is the three-point uh, harness that allows you to take advantage of a, a bolt up in the upper angles. And from that, then, it gives you a very comfortable yet a secure feel to the airframe. When you look at the main landing gear, you'll notice three significant elements. You have your drag link up front, which gives you your triangulated strength for the fore and aft loads. And then you also have your diagonal brace, which really gives you the um, hierarchy in your structure for your main landing gear. That, those two components coupled with your primary axle, which houses your flexible uh, solid fiberglass rod, gives you a very forgiving landing gear and yet a very strong landing gear. When we initially started working with this landing gear, it was very forgiving and very flexible, but at about rotation speed, it gave you a real squirrely feel because the, the wheel was going aft and it would actually have toe out. What we've done is we've lengthened this primary axle four and a half inches out toward the wheel without changing the wheel base of the aircraft or the stance of the aircraft. And what we've also done is we've lengthened this internal fiberglass rod now to a length of 30 inches up inside of the, the gear leg. That by itself will stiffen the gear. What you're looking at in this airframe is the prototype tail. It has a Sitka spruce leading edge, trailing edge, and hard points, as well as a, a foam core and a fiberglass shell. That basic construction pattern is very similar to the plans that you will find on the Honeybee Gyro. The actual production version of the tail, if you buy the airframe kit, has fiberglass clamshells with the same internal structure and it all gets bonded into a one-piece unit. Those one-piece units are bayonet mount and there are three bolts that finish off the arrangement on the tail for mounting it to the airframe and a very simple tail to mount to the airframe and yet strong at the same time. This particular airframe has a Rotex 447 power plant. It is a single carburetor, single ignition. It is coupled with a 2.58 gearbox and a 66 inch power fin two blade propeller. This combination gives us 283 pounds of static thrust and on a 247 pound airframe gives, a, gives you the feel of a very high performance gyro. Now another element in making the gyro, more specifically the honeybee gyro, fly the way it does is the rotor system. This is a 24 foot rotor hawk control system. We use a synchronized system that Neil puts out for us at rotor hawk that uses his blades, which are a three piece aluminum blade. We use a, an aluminum extruded leading edge with stamped and formed skins that are both bonded and riveted to that leading edge. And it is then coupled with a two foot hub bar and then it goes into Neil's control head. Now what we also have for this system to give the, the honeybee gyro a very forgiving, a very easy feel in terms of flying are some, are some different throws. We have a longer control arm on the rotor head and torque tube. That coupled with the right feel through the control stick gives you a very forgiving yet responsive and maneuverable feel to the Honeybee Gyro. Uh, it is not typical in terms of its handling ability because it's not a sensitive aircraft to fly. It's very forgiving. In a lot of cases, it will wait for you uh, in terms of both pitch and roll. In looking at the entire airframe, you really have the vision that Ralph Taggart had in developing a high performance ultralight gyrocopter that started some nine years ago. The Honeybee Gyro is really the outgrowth of that vision. It's a very forgiving aircraft, a very stable aircraft, yet will outperform many of the 
heavier single place and even the two place gyros that are currently on the market. We'd like to invite you to be our guest trying a honeybee gyro and we'd like to thank you for your interest in this project. When we started putting together the honeybee kits for uh, Gyrotech, we realized that not everybody wants to buy a complete uh, gyro. And uh, so we divided it up into basically three packages, so that being the airframe, uh, the critical flight components, and the engine package. But <clears throat> really in talking with a lot of other fellows, they, uh, they maybe have started a gyro bee and wanted to convert to the honeybee, or they needed, uh, they wanted to be able to buy a honeybee, but even in smaller bites. So we start packaging uh, even smaller bites, the, uh, the nose gear, uh, the landing gear, the tail assembly, um, the seat assembly, and so on. And so guys can actually buy smaller bites at a time, and we'll package them and send them out. Uh, if anyone had ever told me that an ultralight, and especially a gyroplane, could have such incredible and varied uh, flight envelopes and yet qualify under part 103, I would have laughed because I didn't think it was possible. When I started flying the honeybee gyro, doing cross countries of 25 to 40 miles, uh, I could not believe how well a 247-pound gyroplane could actually fly. And I'm just thrilled that the honeybee gyro gets to be a part of what's going on on the ultralight side of the gyroplane industry.